All right, here we are, the world champion <laughs> jiu-jitsu fighter, Ron Little, a.k.a. Shorty. Now, uh, well, here we are, Where's Merrick Podcast. Introduce yourself, and uh, where did it start? Where did you start? And how, uh, yeah. So well, my name's Ron, and I started, I got started back, uh, got my love for grappling, basically, when I was young. I got into high school. I was always a small guy, and I was never very big. Uh, I tried to play hockey. Kids just outgrew me. I was never able to kind of play that game. Yeah. You know, kids just got so big. I found wrestling in grade nine, and uh, just fell in love with wrestling. So I started grappling all through high school. Got relatively good at it, real fast. So helped pursue that love of it because I was I was just naturally good at it. I just loved the grappling. I loved the the one-on-one -on -one aspect of the and game. The competition. The comp competitiveness. I had nobody else to blame if I won or lost except for myself. It was a matter of how much work I put into it to make myself better or worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I won some provincial titles. I won some Canadian national titles in wrestling. Really? And then uh, later on in, in high school, grade 12, grade 13 in Ontario, because I grew up in uh, Sarnia, Ontario, I uh, started having some injury troubles. So I, Blew my knees out a couple times. I had a couple like surgeries. ACLs. Yeah, I blew my MCL. Took my ACL out, and then I did it on the took the MCL out on the other knee, and just I started for thrills, right? Just, yeah, just for fun. <laughs> so I started running into a lot of injury trouble, and uh, the doctors basically said, like, you're gonna have to stop. Like, you're getting at the level you want to compete at. Your body's just not gonna. If you keep going the way you are in 15 to 20 years, you're you're not going to be able to walk, you're basically. Gonna be you're going to be busted up. So my dreams of being an Olympic wrestler kind of got shot, right? I was I was already looking to go into university on scholarship to wrestle, and, and it just kind of all kind of blew up on my face, and I kind of stepped away from the sport for a bit. And uh, then I just I was trying to think of what I want to do in my life. I was just working odd jobs around town and just... Where were you living at the time? I was living in Sarnia, Ontario. So you're in Ontario, and then... Another reason why you got into wrestling, was that to, because to, you're a smaller guy, did anyone ever fuck with you, or did you get into the wrestling? To I, I always got kind of picked on, but I was, I was, I was a popular kid, but everybody, I was, I could take the shit and give it back. So right. I, people liked me, because even though I was small, they'd pick on me, but I'd give it back to the big, you know, right. I, I got along with the football players, and yeah, I got yeah, along yeah, with, yeah. so it was, even though they gave me shit, and they pushed me around a bit, I'd always give it back to them. I was right. never one to shy away from a tussle. You know, I yeah, fought yeah, yeah, yeah. some of the toughest guys in town, and you know, whether I got licked or I didn't get licked, it didn't matter to me. So they know like, that if they was gonna fuck, win or, they're, win they're or gonna lose, get, they're gonna get they're, <laughs> something's gonna happen. You're right? gonna take damage. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's how you gotta do it. Yeah. So it was, it was just kind of a fun thing we always did, right? It was just so I always kind of took shit, and gave shit, and I, you know, just it was something I loved to do. It was sweet. So it's like the the physical aspect, and it's just fun to fuck up. Like it's fun to fight. Yeah, it, it is. Every everybody loves to fight in one way or another. You yeah. know what I mean? It's it's human nature to want to have that physical contact with somebody. Everybody's got that aggression in them. It's just yeah. how can you can control it, right? Yeah. Some guys lose it and they just can't control it, and then that's why you get you know fuckheads that just do dumb shit and go around and beat people up, hurt people, kill people, do whatever. Yeah, yeah. Because they've never learned to channel it and control it. But if you can get into a sport like wrestling or now that I've found jujitsu and things like that, it's, it's such a controlled environment. Uh, the more you learn how to do it and control it, the less you want to go be aggressive in the street. Right. Like when I took that time off wrestling, you know, I started hitting the booze and I was having fun and you're bar fighting every weekend yeah. and you're, you're doing dumb shit, right? Because you didn't have that outlet that I was getting from wrestling. You know, if I wanted to compete and, and get that anger and that stress out, I always had wrestling to, to fall back on. Yeah, you yeah, go to the yeah. mat, you could wrestle with somebody that was feeling the same way. You get it out in your two hour training session, you go home, you feel great. You didn't have that anymore. So you had to find another outlet for that aggression you had. And it was drinking and bar fighting and, you know, 100%. chasing women and doing drugs or doing whatever it was, right? Whatever, you just, it, takes. <laughs> whatever it takes whatever. to chase that to get rid of what you, you always had in you that you don't have to get rid of anymore, right? 100%. Like, and my mind is like soccer, so I'll go play soccer. And I just, like, it, it, I, I'm like a, a fun competitive person. Like, I will fucking crush you. But, you know, it's like a good battle and you're stoked about the, a good battle, you know? I mean, yeah. that's like more control. But it's just competition, physical, 
it's a great way. Because then if you don't do that, it turns into like passive aggression. Yeah. And that's no good. So, yeah, like I said, after I got out of wrestling, I, uh, I moved out west. I had a, f- a friend that had moved out here and started working in oil and gas. Yeah. And uh, I was just jumping around odd jobs, cooking in kitchens and doing construction work and painting and just, and I wasn't really making any money, just enough to kind of live. Yeah. And he called me and said, hey man, you got to come to Alberta and make some money. Like we're, you know, at that time, you know, in 2000, you started as a roughneck, you were making 15 bucks an hour. And that was like, I was making $7 an hour doing construction back home. I was like, 15 bucks an hour, man, that is big money plus you're working four more hours double time double time <laughs> yeah let's so go it was i was like there was no brainer i packed my car up headed west and basically never looked back so you know i got out and i started chasing the oil patch for a few years and uh yeah did did the oil patch life there lived it hard and fast so you were on drilling rigs i i started actually my first job was in hdd was it yeah i come out my friend of mine was working for a company called canadian horizontal so I come out and I worked in HDD for a little bit and then uh, it slowed down and then I went, I jumped over to drilling rigs for a little bit and then I went back to HDD and I kind of bounced around and then I just kind of landed in HDD and just never left. It was, I enjoyed it much more than the downhole side of things. It was, I found the, the learning process was better. It wasn't just so straight cut and dry. This is what you do every day. You're tripping pipe in and out, in and out, in and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you was learning to run equipment. I was learning how to weld. I was learning how to fix hydraulics. I was, and I just kind of fell in love with it and just never left. So I just kind of chased the HDD and the pipeline side of things for, for a lot of years, right? Did you, uh, when you work in um, the different quality of people, did you find uh, people working in drilling rigs compared to a pipeline? Were they a different breed of, of man, I guess? <laughs> They're all kind of the same breed. They all kind of fall into the same shell. Uh, but it's, I found in HDD and pipeline, you got more of a mixture of the hot and cold, you call them. You got the guys that run hot and the guys that run cold, right? Where, and I found in the downhole side of things, it was such a, a crew mentality that if you didn't follow the leader, you were out. So if that leader ran hot, the whole crew ran hot. It was right. like, if you're not running hot with everybody, you're out. Right. Because it, 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 you got to... Think what do you mean by hot? It means like partying. Yeah, the guys out. are out there running, you know, chasing the bars every night. They're doing the cocaine. They're doing, you know, chasing the women. They're drinking the booze every night. Right. They're running hot. They're just, they're, re- they're redlining her all the time, <laughs> yeah. right? IRPMs. Yeah, and then you got you got the guys that run cold that just want to be out there, make the money, go home, be with their family yeah. type of thing, right? I found there was a more mixture of that in the pipeline side of things. And you could kind of figure out where you wanted to land. You could kind of watch the guys run hot and have a good time watching them, but you had your guys that you could kind of hang back with and party when you wanted to and not. Yeah. And as I got older, I didn't want to run hot all the time. You no. just can't, right? So your money, money goes, your, money like, goes, oh your body God, can't take where it. Where is it going? You know, it's just, it's just one of them lifestyles you just can't sustain for a long, t- long time, right? No. And if you do, people are like, if you're 50 and you're getting running hot still, it's like, <laughs> Yeah, that's not good. You're not good. You know, you're, like you're not, your getting, life you're not is getting going, respect. <laughs> your life is going nowhere, yeah. So then working on the downhole side, what position was the highest position you made it up to? Did you make it up to driller on the downhole side? Just motor the, just motor hand just on the motor downhole side, yeah. Nice. I didn't stick around too long on the downhole side, like I said. I, and I kind of bounced around in, in divisions of downhole. I worked for Weatherford doing underbalance type of stuff. And, you know, I kind of bounced around. I ran uh, power tongs on service rigs for a little bit. So yeah, yeah. I kind of dabbled in a little bit of everything, but I always always went back to the HDD side of things. Gotcha. Now, uh, I always, I worked in uh, oil and gas for like nine years, now nine, ten years, and I, I learned so many great values and lessons. How about you for oil and gas? What was like some of the greatest lessons or things where you said, I take out of oil and gas and now I apply it to real life and it's just, I'm miles ahead of other people. Like for me, like this, I started a business window washing because I can go literally for 24 hours straight. It's just, people are like, oh, you're still gonna work? So I'm like, still gonna work? Yeah. It's only been 10 hours, <laughs> silly. Like I got like six That is the left. biggest thing. The, the amount of work ethic people have that make it in the, in the oil and gas industry is far above anything else you can even imagine. Like guys that think they're successful working a nine to five in a bank and they're like, oh yeah, I work hard, I get up every day. And go to the bank for nine and I would get off at 4.30. I'm like, our 
we've already done three quarters of a day by fucking nine o'clock. You know what I mean? It's like, we're, we've already, we've been up since five, you know, worked hard till nine, nine thirty. We're, and we still got another eight hours ahead of us. We're still going, right? Yeah. And then plus you still got another like 40 days to yeah, go. To go. And we're you working know? seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Sometimes your crew runs hot. They don't show up. You're, you're filling <laughs> you're in until they show up. <laughs> you don't shut so. down. Yeah, I think that's one of those uh, greatest things that I learned about oil and gas is just. And then another thing I really uh, loved is when I got there, I was a kid. I had the mentality that things were impossible. And the one thing that was never accepted was that this is impossible. No matter what, no you matter know. what, the job will get done. You will find a way. We will it. find a way. And if you're a little bitch, <laughs> yeah, it's impossible. You can go fuck off. <laughs> like get out of my sight, worm. Yeah. And yeah, that. there's you'll always find a way, and you learn so many different ways of doing things because you've got such a diverse culture. I find in oil and gas of young and old, and people that have just have weird, wacky quirks and ideas, and they think outside of the box. And you're like, I never thought of thinking doing something. Like that. Let's try that. Holy shit, that worked! <laughs> like, yeah, I thought that would fucking ever work. Like, that's crazy. Latvian ingenuity. Yeah, here. Latvian ingenuity. <laughs> yeah, so. So yeah, I guess then um, oil and gas does teach you a lot of great things. What are the, some of the things you hated about oil and gas? The worst part about oil and gas is the stress on family life, I find, is the biggest thing. Especially yeah. after I, you know, I, I met my now wife and, and you, you start dating and you start having a relationship. And then you get married and you have a kid. That, that time away from your family gets harder and harder and harder as the years go on, right? It's, it puts a toll on a family. It takes a it takes a really strong woman and, and family to, to deal with that, right? It 100%. takes, you know, a real independent woman to be able to trust you while you're away. You're trusting her while she's here. It, it's, you know, it causes, it can cause a lot of rift and, and a lot of problems for sure. This is a really, this is one of the things I would like to talk about because you're one of the few guys that I see actually his family life looks like it's together, you know? So how, like, there's so many guys that don't have their shit together, especially in the family life. And that's, I think, because uh, they picked, on the male side, they picked the wrong woman that perhaps is, you know, promiscuous or gold diggerish, you know, where, um, and he's gone all the time. But I always look at it, the guy's providing a pretty amazing lifestyle. I mean, there has to be some, some give back. And uh, this feels, like, how do you pick or how do you manage it's it's not easy for yeah. sure. No, it's and like I said, a lot of it is is on the side of uh, your woman too. Like, I I found a real strong independent woman who's can look after herself and is very independent already. Yeah. So she she likes to she can really take charge when she has to, and then when I'm home, it doesn't take her much to take that step back and say, okay, well now my job's over. You're home. Yeah. Now you're gonna start. I'm start, going to start delegating all the tasks that I was doing while you were gone. Now, now you can get up every morning to kids school and you can take her to her, yeah, you know, yeah. cheer competition. And I'll just take that step back now. And then she gets her break. Right. Nice. Cause you, you can put a lot on their plate when you leave all the time. Yeah. You're out there making the money to, to give them the life that they deserve, but the amount of work they got to do when they're gone is incredible. Like they, yeah. they got to run everything. They got to look after your finances. They got to look after your kid. They got to look after your house. They got to do all the, what we call blue jobs and pink jobs. They got to do all the blue jobs too. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're out there cutting the grass while you're gone and stuff like that. So you need a, a strong woman that's, that can, you know, lead when she has to, but step back at the same time when you're around. What kind of characteristics like are those? Like when you were dating your wife, you could see those right away or, how did uh, that kind of was seen? Yeah, kind of saw it right away because when I first met her, she basically was like, this is who I am. This is what I am. Take it or leave it. This is like, I'm not going to sugarcoat nothing for you. So strap on the boots because this is the ride you're going to go on, right? Because she never really didn't give me that fake side when we started dating. It right. was like, this is who I am. You know, I got a little bit of crazy. I got a little bit. Of, I'm fucked up sometimes. And I got... <laughs> You know, everybody's got their issues. I got some fucked up family. You got some fucked up family. It, it, shit happens. And she was just, right from the get-go, we were just kind of honest with each other. And I found that was probably yeah, a leading it's aspect. it's nice when it's all up front. And, yeah. you know, and not like, like... So when the crazy comes out, you're not like, holy fuck, where'd yeah, that crazy come from? Why are you... She kind of already told me she was crazy. I just hadn't <laughs> seen it yet. You know what I mean? And the closet was open. It's like, oh, okay, I'm ready for this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sweet. So then you were, uh, took a... 
took some time away from the, the training, the, and you went to the, the, obviously, to Reagan. How old were you when you got, started dating your wife, becoming a, uh, a family man, and then when did you start going back into competitive sports? I got with my, my wife. My wife was just, uh, was 19, going on 20, real, just about turning 20, and I was 27, going on 28. So I was a little older than her, and uh, we kind of met at a bar, and I had just got out of a long-term relationship. wasn't really looking for anything, and I, I kind of met her, and then we just started hanging out, and then I was like, man, that's cool as shit. Like, she was honest off right off the bat. She never bullshitted me, and it was like, it was an odd thing to have a girl that was just like, this is who I am, right? Didn't sugarcoat nothing, didn't hide nothing from me. I wasn't playing any games. Yeah, I fucking hate games. <laughs> so I was like, man, I kind of like this shit. I, so we just... And from that day we met, we just, I took her on another date. And it just kind of snowballed into a relationship, right? And then we kind of moved in together. And I was like, man, I think this, this is the one after about, I think it must have been five years. It was about four to five years. So you're 32, 33-ish. I was going, yeah, I was going on 30. Okay. 30, 31. And uh, then I decided, I think I think this is the one. I, I, I was always that type of guy that never thought I'd ever get married. But you start, like... Uh, for to find a woman that can deal with me being away and still, you know, love me when I get home, and it, it always seemed to work with us. But I was like, I'm gonna grab onto this one. So okay. I decided to ask her to marry me, and luckily enough, she said yes. And uh, like a year later, we had our daughter. And then uh, about three to four years after our daughter was born, I was like, having a little girl. I was like, I want my little girl to be able to protect herself. I was always the type of guy that, because I knew I was going to be small, I always wanted to be able to protect myself, I always wanted to be able to defend myself, I was like, I need my little girl. The way the world, I could see the way the world's going, I'm like, shit's getting out of hand, and I want my little girl to be able to feel comfortable when she's not with me, or with my wife, right? I don't want her to have to think, I need my parents there to, to defend me, I want to be able to do that on my own. So... I started looking into stuff for kids. Uh, I, was, I wanted her to get into like a con combat type sports, right? MMA was getting big and, and with me coming from a wrestling background, I started looking into things that I could find for her to do. And I always knew about jiu-jitsu, but I'd never really tried it myself. Cause I was always, in my head, I, my grappling careers were over cause my knees were so bad and right. I was so beat up. So I found a jiu-jitsu gym called Gracie Baja in West Edmonton. And they were going to start offering uh, kids classes for age four. And it was the youngest I'd ever seen a school do that. You know, most kids start at eight, nine, ten years old, right? So they, these guys were starting to open it up to really young kids. And I'm like, what a great thing to get my daughter into. It teaches her confidence, teaches her self-defense. And, and discipline. And discipline. She's going to go in there. Yeah, she's, she's learning respect, discipline. She's learning to defend herself so that if she ever gets attacked, she can not only defend herself, but subdue somebody long enough to get away. Right. Because one thing you learn in jiu-jitsu is, is you're not out to, to hurt or injure anybody. You don't want to, you just want to subdue them and, and make them submit to whatever you're doing, right? right? So it's like, I want to stop your aggression towards me by submitting you, whether I put you unconscious, whether I break your arm, whether I do whatever I have to do, but it's the last resort is I want to physically hurt you. So a lot of jujitsu is based on control and positioning where you just control the situation, right? right? So I wanted my daughter to learn that. So as she got older into her teen years, she always had something where she could defend herself if she ever had a young boy come at her or whatever. She's at a party and she's had too much to drink and some guy crawls on top of her. She knows how to get out of that situation, right. being a young girl, right? Because I mean, you're always gonna worry about it as a dad with a daughter, right? And there's so many other things with, uh, I think, martial arts. I've done a couple of training sessions around the world, uh, but there's, you get so many awesome things when you do martial arts and you get that confidence. Like, as soon as you know you can, you. And the confidence where if someone doesn't like what you say, you're like, hey, man, like, I can say whatever I want now because you can't do anything about it. So you're not, you don't have fear anymore. You know, you, you lose that fear of, like, you know, being yourself or saying something that you think is wrong. It's like, hey, I think this is wrong, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Or someone is trying to do something, you have the confidence to stop it, right? And then also you get the respect of your opponent, too. 
And uh, I think that's super important too. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like I said, I got my daughter into jujitsu and she did it for about, I don't know, must have been about six years, I think. And then it started to, jujitsu is a sport at the same time as it is learning self-defense and, and all that kind of stuff. And it just got too competitive for her. And, and my daughter's not, she likes sports, but isn't super one-on-one -on -one competitive. She doesn't have that one-on-one -on -one competitive. She likes right. more of a team right. aspect where she's got friends with her. She doesn't, it's almost like she just doesn't like having that, all the stress on her type of thing. And, and I noticed that at a young age and that's just kind of the way it was. So she kind of stepped away from jujitsu. But at the same time as I was watching her come up, the coach just kept going, why don't you get on the mat? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm too old. I'm 32 years old. Yeah? I'm too old to get on the mat. I'm like, I can't do that shit. I'm like, I'm busted old and half, you know, I'm drinking for 10 years. I can't do that shit. <laughs> like, so they kept bugging me every time I took my daughter. Just try a class after her. Just try a class after her. Just, you can do a week for free. So finally I was like, you know what? I'm going to try a class. So I stayed after my daughter's class. I stayed and I did a class and I was like, I love this. Like it was like, it was instant. It was like that I got my ass whooped and that was the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. I was like, I love this. And it was like, I got bit by the bug and it was like, I'm like, there's no turning back. You're done. This, this, I'm, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. This was <laughs> the greatest thing. Like, cause the one thing I found about jujitsu that really resonates with me it's all the stresses and all the bullshit you take on in life. When you step on that mat with another person and you're having that combat, nothing else matters. No. Because you can't think about, oh shit, did I have that argument with my wife? Oh shit, what was that problem at work? Because if I stop to think about that shit, done. I'm fucked up. Done. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. So in that moment, for those five minutes or those six minutes that you're having that battle, oh. You're laser focused on everything that's going on in that moment and nothing else matters. It just drains away everything else that you, stresses, shit you got going on in life just fucking disappears for five minutes. Especially like, like the art of the combat because you, you don't want to lose either. So like, you you're like the lose. animal side starts to engage hard. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing that resonated and made me fall in love with Jiu Jitsu was that all that bullshit and that stress you always brought home from work and brought to your family and they and had to they had to deal with you for the first two weeks after getting home from work after a shitty hit you're all like grumpy and pissy and you're taking it out on your wife she, she didn't do nothing but you're still mad at her because of shit that went on at work yeah 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 you come home you go to the gym you battle it out with 10 guys that want to do the same thing and everybody gets their shit out you know you get that combat out and everything just leaves and you're just like that sense of calm comes over you. And then Meditation. you can deal with, yeah, you can deal with life. It's great. Man, I know exactly the feeling. It's like when I surf and it's big, when you're out there, it's just like, there's only one thought is survival. Yeah. It's just like, you got these massive waves of water and if you get eaten up, you're just gonna get pitted. It's wave after wave smashing you and you're just like, oh, this is so stressful <laughs> and great. And there's only one, like only thought is just like, if I have any other thought, I have fear, I'll, I'll fuck up in that way and I'll get eaten and I'll get pitted and I'll have a wave smashed on me for like... 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, and then it's just like, fuck this. Yeah. So it's the same thing, man. It's that, it's that meditation. It's when you have like extreme moments. I don't think there's anything more extreme than combat, you know? Yeah. You have an opponent, right? Like if it was like real, real life, like that's like the ultimate, you know, I mean, f mind focus. So it's, it's the same thing, man. It's so cool having that... Zen. Yeah. Where you it's like to me it's like women have yoga. I men have jiu jitsu. It's like it's that, that physical combat and it's just like there's nothing like it. Okay, so you got bitten by the bug. You you started going and then were you still working the rigs at the time? Because it'd be hard to I've I've never stopped working the rigs. I've been doing the rigs for twenty five years now. It's like You went to the office so when your daughter was born, right? No, I didn't go my daughter was about Eight or nine, I think, when I went into the office for a couple of years. So you were still, and then, so she went jujitsu at four. So you were yeah, still. Yeah, she went from like about four to, I believe it was around eight, eight years old. Okay. And then she stepped away, and I, I started when she was about seven or eight. I started my first year. And uh, yeah, I just, she left, and I just continued on from there. And I would just, it was one of them things where I would go to work, I'd come home, and just train as much as I could. Yeah. Trying to balance between 
my love now that I had for jujitsu and my time with my family. Because it's hard too when you travel for work all the time and then come home, your family misses you, right? So I miss my family, but I still miss this that I need in my life to, to deal with all my other bullshit, right? Yeah. It's my form of meditation. So to try and find the balance of, okay, how much time do I give to that and how much time do I give to my family to keep that balance of work, right. jujitsu, and life, right? Gotcha. So it's, it's a struggle sometimes, and sometimes, you know, when I, when competitions are coming up, especially now that I'm getting more competitive and I'm, you know, I'm training for things like a world championship and, and things like that, there, there is some sacrifice that your family has to take again. And, and that's another thing, you know, having that strong woman too, because, you know, I'm gone away from work for, say, 20, 30 days. I come home and I know I'm only going to be home for 14, and now I want to spend 14 days in the gym. Yeah, so basically, my first year as, as a white belt in jiu-jitsu, I was basically just learning the ropes of jiu-jitsu. It's one of them things where it's, as a white belt, it's such an information overload, right? right. It's just like, they're throwing so many things at you, and it's just like, holy, I'm just going to try and hang on to as much information <laughs> as I can, because it's just like a flood of information into your brain, right? And it's just one of them things where you just... So my first year, I was, wasn't really thinking about competition right i was just i just wanted to immerse myself in it as much as i could and learn and have that experience on the mats with people and just just get training again and you kind of have a tribe too you know it's your crew now right yeah it's and it's it's weird because it be, they become a second family to you almost right yeah, like yeah, there's yeah. you know there's people that you meet and it's just you bond with and you have that competition with on the mats every day struggling back and forth with each other and you build a bond through 100%. it right so yeah it was, it was it was quite the quite an interesting thing and then my coach talked me into doing uh, a tournament called pan ams which is in the ibjjf okay. which is the international brazilian jiu-jitsu federation and it's kind of like the mecca of jiu-jitsu in form of competition right they're they're the biggest uh, practitioners of jiu-jitsu the, they bring on the biggest tournaments they, you know they're, they're the hosters when you win an IBJJF world title it's 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 a big deal right in gotcha. the jiu-jitsu community that's, so it's kind of like winning the Stanley Cup in the NHL okay. right? so it's the top top shelf top shelf type stuff so they my coach talked me into they were the team was all taking a trip to California to do a tournament called Pan Americans right so I was a white belt, and I was like, no, I'm not ready to compete. I'm not ready. I haven't learned enough. And he's just like, learning jiu-jitsu is like baking a cake. He's like, you got to throw all the ingredients in there and mix them around. But once you bake that cake, if you don't eat it, how do you know how this cake turned out? Competition is the same way. You, you've put all these techniques together and built your cake. You baked it. Let's go, eat it. Go fucking eat it. Let's, let's go eat that <laughs> fucking go. cake. Here's the fork. Get on the plate. Let's go. So, so he, he finally talked me into going down and doing one of these major competitions. And it's it's a big deal when you go down. And, it, and it, not only with the stress of it being a major tournament, because they do four majors a year. There's Pan Americans, there's Brazilian Aerials, Europeans, and Worlds. So not only being one of the four biggest tournaments that they do every year, it was like my first one I'm ever going to do. And I'm right. like, Holy shit, man! I went down to this tournament in a different country. I got to fuck compete for the first time. This is a time. big fucking four. <laughs> yeah, and I, I went down there, and the competition started, and it was like my old wrestling days kicked in, and you always, I'd been in big situations in wrestling before, and, I, and it was just something I kind of forgot, but it always kind of was in there. And as soon as I walked out on that mat in that big stage, and I was like, I fucking been here before, yeah, yeah. and everything just calmed. And I'm like, I got this. And I went out there and I fought and I ended up winning Pan Ams as a white belt. And so that was competing against other white belts? Other white belts. You always compete in your age and belt rank, right? So uh, I went down there and I was fighting a Masters 2, which is anyone uh, age 30 to 35. Gotcha. So I, I'd won Pan Ams as a white belt. And it was like, man, my first tournament, I went a major at an IBJS tournament. And that just kicked the vein in a little yeah, harder it was like took another shot out. I was like holy now now I had that that bite for competition so it it heightened my my love for jiu-jitsu even more because now I've got that competitive outlet yeah. not only am I training every day and having fun now I've got something to work towards right so you like the cake yeah I like the cake yeah the cake was oh good. I hate that cake <laughs> such a good cake so 
So yeah, you know, I found that I refound that love for that competition, which was which was huge, right? It was it was a fun fun thing to go through, and I didn't think I was going to be able to do it at my age again. You know, that gives you like massive purpose, right? Yeah. And now it's just like you're going to work and you're training harder because there's a reason. Yeah, there's a reason, and and it helped. At work too. I go to work and I found instead of just going to work for 20, 30 days and laying around in my shack, now that you're tool push and doing nothing, I'm exercising in my shack. I'm going for runs at night. I'm because I'm, I'm in my head. I'm like, if I take 20 days off, everybody I'm competing against is working hard for 20 days. Right. I can't be that guy that's going to try and come back after 20 days of sitting on the couch and try and compete with a guy that's just been training for 20 days because you're going to get your ass whooped. So it, it motivated me to stay healthy and stay fit in other aspects of my life too, right? So it was uh, it was definitely an interesting time for sure. Okay, so then you found a way to do the oil patch life, still trained, and then what? See, as you like your belt rank went up, so you went white belt to blue belt blue belt did you go to pan ams for each belt ranking and did you compete and then did you become did you win those i champions? went i went pan, pan ams became a tournament that i started to do all the time as a white belt you can't compete at, at the world level yet they, you can't do that to your blue belt so i competed at pan ams i had one pan ams and after that i think it was about two months after my pan ams win i got promoted to blue belt gotcha so it takes about a year of training from white belt to to blue belt level right. so I got awarded my blue belt, and then I, that year I was like, I made the decision, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to try and win Pan Ams as a blue belt, and then I'm going to go after the World Master title, which okay. is, World Masters is like, worlds for anybody over the age of 30. So they got, the IBJs have worlds and World Masters, there's two separate, so Which anybody, one's bigger? Which one's more prestigious? The more prestigious one is IBJs have worlds, which is kids ages 18 to 30. Right. They, they do have some older guys that, you know, black belts and stuff that, that do compete at the adult level still. But for a guy that's 35, 40 years old, to try and go down and battle hard with a, for 10 minutes with an 18-year-old is pretty, pretty tough to do. <laughs> I, I don't care who you are. Your father time does get you. <laughs> so they do have a world's, uh, secondary world's, that's a world, what they call the world masters for anybody over the age of 30. So it goes 30 to 35, 35 to 40, 40 you know, and up. So they got different masters levels. So I, I made the decision that I was going to go to masters world, Pan Ams and masters world that year and, and see how I was going to do. So I went down to Pan Ams, which usually happens end of March and won it as a blue belt. So, so now more heroin. Yeah, or, uh, that cake is getting bigger yeah, right. and it's tasting way better. <laughs> okay. So now, you know, I'm, I've got that. And I'm like, man, I can, I can do this. Like, I, I, I started feeling like I'm getting that whole wrestling mindset going back. I'm like, even at my age, I can do this. Like, I, I, can, I can be competitive. I can win. and showing it at a big scale. So the drive after winning Pan Ams, I started really training hard for Worlds, right? And uh, so... Few months later, because it was hap Worlds happens usually the end of August into early September, uh, went down and won Worlds as a blue belt. Nice. Oh, cake. Now, Give me that cake. You know, I went down there and I won it, won Worlds as a as a blue belt. My first year at blue belt, which is you know hard to do because in jiu jitsu, blue belt is a belt you have the longest. It's the longest span of learning in jiu jitsu, and it takes an average of two years to get out of your blue belt. Right. So when you're when you go down there and compete at a blue belt, you've got such a vast variety of talent because you've got blue belts that have just started like me yeah. that have just moved up from white belt to blue belt. And you've got blue belts that have been a blue belt for two, two and a half years, sometimes three that are still blue belts, right? So I may have to fight a guy that's had has been training for three years longer than me, but it's still a blue belt. What gives you the advantage then? Is it just because you're like hyper competitive? Or? I think it, a lot of it has to do with more with my hyper competitiveness to be good and the fact that I when I'm at home and training I put myself in uncomfortable situations I don't want to be the best in the gym I want to be the guy that's getting beat up in the gym every day because if you're if you're training with guys that are better than you every day oh yeah you're gonna get better 100% Blah, blah, blah. Like if you're getting beat up every day, you're now having to problem solve to get out of that situation every day in the gym. 
and you're working harder than them guys are because if they're if they're the best guy in their gym as a blue belt and they're beating up all the other blue belts they're just they're staying here yeah for me i'm working against these young kids and i'm trying to you know i go to a local tournament and i would fight at the adult level locally to fight young kids all the time right, right. and you know i may win a couple i may lose a few but i'm always i was always doing it to learn right. because i want to and the pace they put on you forces you to work harder or so smarter. smarter and harder yeah. so when i went down to the masters world's level and now if competing against guys in my age and my belt i just put it on because i'm i've been rolling eight to ten minutes with 18 year old yeah, yeah, kids yeah. that don't stop coming at you and now i'm rolling with a 35 year old guy and i'm coming at him like an 18 year old yeah and you break them like they just physically just the pressure of just coming at them all the time they just can't take it anymore they just physically break and then once you've mentally broke them they're done that's awesome I love that. So I, I just, that's one of the things I love about Jesus is mentally breaking somebody while you're fighting them. You can just see them give up. Yeah. And then you're like, I got you. Done. You're done. So did you win uh, Pan Ams and World's Masters at each belt, belt level you moved up? So you won it at the blues, you won it at white, you won it at brown or red? I won it. Or yellow. I actually won it twice at blue belt. Okay. Because the thing Two is years. with blue belt, I got to have my blue belt for a couple of years. So I, uh, I went and won it again at, at Blue Belt my, my second year yeah. and then got promoted to, to Purple Belt. And then uh, my first year at Purple Belt, I struggled at Purple Belt. It was a weird belt for me. Um, Why? Just because uh, the competition was way more fierce? Yeah, it, it, was, it was weird because it, at Blue Belt, you're kind of finding where you land in jiu-jitsu. Guys have certain games in jiu-jitsu. A lot of guys are top guy players or bottom guy players. They like to more be on their back playing off the guard. Some guys like to be, you know, or more of a top player, like to pass guards, things like that. Um, guys are still figuring out in blue belt what game they like to play. And they're still taking in all that information, right? There's so many techniques and things you need to learn to build your style, your style of jiu-jitsu. Yeah. When you hit purple belt, guys know style. how to do jiu-jitsu and now they're honing their style gotcha so it's it's a weird it's a weird spot to be it's like the the level is it's all over the place guys because everybody's good but there's some guys that have just now figured out their style they're now chaining moves together one after another after another and it's so, like art then right That's yeah it becomes that that what we call jiu-jitsu flow where right. guys are just like okay I've given you a problem, you solved that problem, I've given you another problem, I've solved that problem, boom, boom, boom. And it's and it's like how many problems can I give you that you can't until I find one you can't yeah. solve. So okay. it's just so it becomes that jujitsu flow where it's like, yeah, you gave me a problem, boom, I, I solved that problem. Oh, you gave me another problem, I solved that. You gave me another problem, I didn't have the answer. And now now we're done. Now right? Done. So it's it's that that progression into now you found your style and how to start linking and chaining techniques together to give them a problem, give them another problem. Oh, I baited you with it. Now you're doing bait and switches where I'm gonna make you think I'm doing this, but I'm actually, I'm three moves ahead. Now I'm gonna make you go this way so I can get you to do that and get this. And then you're done. And then you're done. So purple was tough. Purple was tough. I struggled, my first years of purple belt, I struggled real hard. I got beat up lots. I was, wasn't very successful in tournaments, I was getting you know, beat out first match lots of times. Uh, I ended up, uh, I got a third at Pan Am's, as a purple belt. And then I went to World Masters, feeling pretty confident. I, everybody that was in my, in my division at World Masters, I, I had beaten before through the year, through the tournament year. And uh, I ended up losing the semifinals and getting a bronze at purple belt my first year. But, you know, it was a letdown and it was disappointing. And then, uh, Why did yeah, the guy just was... I just made a mistake, I, and then uh, I got down on points, and then he rolled the clock out on me. It was one of the things where I was trying to try to pass, and he just wouldn't let me. He just kind of stalled the clock. Okay. He knew he wasn't going to let me get the points I needed to, to get up on him again, and he just kind of rolled the clock out, man. And it, it was, and it happened. Strategic, you know? it, he was strategic. He, he played the tournament game better than I did that day. Yeah. And it was, it was just one of them things where I got caught, made a mistake, and I never recovered from it, so... It was, it was a little disheartening to get that bronze, you know, because I always, in my head, I'm going to win every tournament I go into. Right. Yeah. Now, right? Now, yeah. 
The winter cake. I got the winter cake, and they love eating the winter cake. So it's not the prawn. But you gotta have them disappointments to build your jujitsu, right? So after I after I got the bronze at purple belt, uh, fucking COVID hit, and you know fucked up a lot of things in the world. So uh, they canceled a lot of tournaments. There wasn't gonna be a world championships. Gyms were closing. Everybody was trying to you know figure out where they wanted to be. I was struggling at the same time at Purple, being at the gym I was at. You know, at the time I was still at Gracie Baja. But I I wasn't getting along with the team as well. Because a great school as Gracie Baja is, they're more of a, a family-oriented school. It's kind of like jiu-jitsu is for everybody. They didn't really have that fiery competition team that I, I strive for. You know, that we had six, seven guys in the gym that were really competitive, that traveled and, and you know, were competitive guys. And you got along with those guys? I got along with those guys really well, but we were a small knit group, right? And okay, it just, so it's the birds of a feather flock together. You had the fun people and you had... You had the family, culture. friendly guys that were just there to do, to stay in shape and have fun and learn some self-defense. And then you're they, rolling them. Well, you just, you don't get that competitive fire from them, right? right. So you're always rolling with the same two, three guys that want to have that competitive you know, I gotta start going hard. I got a tournament coming up. I got I got. I need guys that are gonna want push me in, in class and you know make you work hard, right? Right. And you just, I just wasn't getting that, and I struggled. But the thing with jujitsu is you make that family, and it was like, I know there's a better place for me to be, but how do I leave that? You know what I mean? It oh, was like they're gonna be sad. Well, not only that, it was like you've you've met so many people and you've you've created this bond with the team of Gracie Baja themselves, not only did I have a school here, anytime I traveled anywhere, I could walk into a Gracie Baja school and they'd open it with open arms and you met so many people. I had friends in California and I had friends in Arizona and I had everywhere I'd traveled for Jiu Jitsu, I always had a school I could go to and train at. People would welcome you in and they'd look after you and they would coach you when your coach couldn't be down at a tournament. And, and it was just like, how do you leave that? You know what I mean? Am I gonna disappoint these guys by trying to better myself yeah, 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 and going somewhere where I believe I need to be? But these guys have done so much for me, right? I know. So I was in that kind of conundrum and it was kind of good that COVID hit when it did because I was debating whether or not to leave that team and then gym shut down. Right. So it kind of gave me an out. So I was like- Okay. Gyms were closed anyway, so I kind of told my professor, I was like, I'm going to step away from jiu-jitsu. I, you know, I just struggled through my first year of Purple Belt. I'd had some injuries. I was struggling. I, I blew my knee out again, so I'd had another knee surgery. ACL? And I, uh, no, it was LCL that time. And then I, you know, I had... Uh, How many LCLs? <laughs> then I had, a, I had a bad ankle. I'd had my, my ankle messed up, and I had a shoulder injury. And I, was, I said, I'm just going to take some time off while COVID is here and just step away from jiu-jitsu and just kind of... Yeah. Yeah, get my head right, get my body healthy. Yeah, that's super important because, man, it's hard to not train because you love it so much. Love it so but much. when you're injured, you're just like, man, I know I'm just making this worse, worse and worse. Yeah, and you struggle through training every day and you're oh. not getting any better because it, you're yeah. injured and you're labored. You're, you're and, uh, nursing it <laughs> and you don't have full, I know the exact feeling. Yeah. It's hard. But you want to be there every, every day. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. So I, I took some time off and uh, there's a gym locally here in Sherwood Park where I am now. And I've, I've always known the guys there, and I was, I was friends with the professor over there too, because being in Short Park, kind of a small knit community, we, everybody knows each other in Jiu Jitsu too. And he's always like, you should be at this gym, we're competitive, he goes, he goes you should be at this gym. It's closer to home. It's closer to home. Sell. But he just, he, he, he liked my style of Jiu Jitsu, and he's like, I can take you to the next level. Of competitor. Of, of competitor. I know you want to compete, and my gym can offer you that. Right. So it was one of them things where I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a try. So I left Gracie Baja and I now train at uh, Frontline Carlson Gracie here in Sherwood Park. Did you uh, relax? Like, did you let your body heal first? I let my body heal for probably five to six months while COVID was on. 100%, man. Yeah, because that's what it takes, actually. Yeah, so I took some time off and I just, you know, COVID was there. Nobody was working anyways. I was doing it. So I just kind of chilled, let my body heal and spent some time with the family. And, and then... Uh, 
we started doing some, because uh, COVID was still around, but everybody was like, COVID's bullshit. Like, Fuck COVID. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, let's go. So we can't, we can't leave our shit closed anymore. Guys got to do shit. So we started having some uh, underground meets where we everybody turned their basement into a gym, and everybody would just come to your house, and we'd have four or five guys training in the basement. <laughs> and then we'd be like, oh, people are noticing we're coming here, so we'd go to somebody else's house, train in their basement. <laughs> You know, we'd sneak late at night, we'd go to the gym, sneak in the back door, <laughs> have a training session, you know what I mean, with select groups of guys that weren't going to rat each other out right. and, and do that kind of stuff. And, and we were smart about it. It wasn't like I was going to, if I wasn't feeling well, I was going to go there and get everybody sick. If you guys felt shitty, they stayed home. You know what Obviously. I mean? Yeah. I'm not you know what? That's common sense. Common sense. That's, yeah. no, that's, that's just logical. It's just normal. Life, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, hey, I feel shitty. I'm not going to go there and get everybody else yeah. sick. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, but yeah, so we started having some underground jiu-jitsu and I started to build some pretty good bonds with the guys at Frontline and then I finally told the Professor, you know, he's been letting me train now for two, three months while COVID's done, all these little underground spots, not making me pay anything to be a gym member. So I finally said, you know what, I'm going to gonna come and I signed up and have a look back. So. so now, and then just the difference between the gyms is this is less more, this, the Frontline is less family friendly and more competitive frontline is frontline by far has i would say not just because i'm there but by far has the best jiu-jitsu in western camp bar not they have the best professor uh there's it's a no bullshit gym everybody in there is training hard everybody wants to learn and train hard whether they're, they're competitive or not when you do sparring at the end of class after learning a technique or whatever we did that day Everybody's sparring hard. Everybody's coming at you hard. And they know when guys got tournaments coming up, everybody, even that guys that aren't competitive, are there to put in the work with you. They'll show up every day and put it on you and come at you hard, even though they don't even got to compete. But they're, they're there working with you every day and working hard. And it was just the atmosphere there. It was like, it was, I found a new home. So it was just like, this is where I need to be. And, awesome. Yeah. So then your purple belt when you moved to this gym, and then did you have luck when you went to another tournament as a purple belt or did you ready I, to go to a red belt, right? That's the next one. No, brown is after purple. But so as purple belt, I was about a year and a half at, at purple belt at Frontline. And uh, because of COVID, there wasn't a Worlds that year, the right. World Masters that year. So my second year of purple belt was kind of a wash. There wasn't really much going on. There was no tournaments. So... Training was up and down all over the place because gyms were shutting down, gyms were open, gyms were yeah, shutting yeah, yeah. down kind of shit. So I, I spent a year, my second year at Purple Belt was kind of a wash. And then we went into my third year at Purple Belt and they announced that it was kind of halfway through through the year. They announced we're going to put on Worlds in December okay. in Florida. Cause Flor because Florida was kind of wide open oh, at the yeah, time. Oh, yeah, they didn't give a shit. <laughs> they didn't give a shit. So I told the coach and my wife and everything, I said, you know what, I'm going to go make a run at Purple Belt. Because my goal, after I'd won it at, at Blue Belt twice, my goal now is I want to win Worlds at every belt. Right. So I started training hard, working hard while I was away at work, and I was making that run for that World at, in December. So I traveled down there. My professor couldn't go with me because of COVID and things he had to do with the gym. So there was, I think there was three of us from the team that went down. And... Uh, he made sure I had a coach when I went down there. So when I landed there, he had a guy there to look after me and make sure he was there to coach me. When like I, a Florida coach? Uh, yeah, like I, just a Brazilian guy that he knew that was down there. Okay, uh, cool. Alexander Molinero. He uh, was a friend of his, so he called him and said, hey, I got this competitor coming down. Look after him, make sure you coach him while he's down there because I can't be there. So, he, you know, he went above and beyond that type of thing, which is one thing I love about that gym. Even when the coaches can't be there, they'll find somebody to be there for you. And the coach is really handy just because he's like, hey man, like this is where he's getting you. Yeah. Pull your shit together, shorty. Yeah. So I went down there and I met Molina. The first time I'd ever met him. And, you know, we kind of hung out. He took me under his wing, black belt, adult black belt. We probably, I think we, at the time, he was ranked seven in the world as a black belt. Like, so he's a talented, talented guy too. And, uh, right. yeah, so he started, I started my world's competition. He was coaching me and won my first mm -hmm. match. Won my second match, went into the finals, and won the finals handily as a purple belt. So I won it a third time, purple belt. So shorty, three, three time world champion. Big got tastier. Yeah, <laughs> triple C, triple C. So yeah, it was a it was a great moment, and I was 
you know, so I, I could just taste that goal of getting closer. Because I knew now that I've won at a purple belt, one of the things my professors always said that after you win a world title at your belt, you got nowhere else to go. So you might as well go up a belt. You may get beat up for the next five years, but hey, you're, you've, you've accomplished everything you can at that belt. Yeah, 100%. So whether, you know, some guy, I, I personally didn't think I was ready for my brown belt yet, but I came back after Worlds, and then the following year in February, uh, we were having an underground class, and my professor promoted me to, to ground belt after class. It was a kind of a surreal moment, because it was such a, an accomplishment to get there, because now at brown belt, my next step is black belt. Like, I'm, I'm on the verge of being a black belt, so within the next two years, you know, I'm gonna be a black belt, which is, it takes like 10 years to get there. So it's like the accomplishment of getting that belt was like, and COVID is just kind of dwindling down and we're doing an underground training session. I'm like, I just couldn't go to brown belt. I can't tell nobody. You know what I mean? It was, just like, it was so surreal. I can't post it. I can't brag about it. I'm now a brown belt. And I'm like, I can't tell nobody except just, my wife. It's just, it's just me. But in a way it was good. It was just like, it was that moment. It was between me and him. He, you know, he respected me the fact that I was ready for that belt, he gave it to me, and it was a, it was an honored moment, and it was pretty cool. So. so are you still a brown belt? I'm still a brown belt, yeah. And then you're working your way up to get your world title. Yeah, I went to uh, went to Worlds my first year at brown belt. Uh, lost my lost my first match, but I went into Worlds that year injured. I had a bad I had a bad knee. It wasn't I wasn't really fucked up, but I had a, I, I went in injured. I wasn't 100 percent, and uh, I lost my first match. At, uh, at Worlds that year. And uh, then I went back the next year and ended up with bronze, lost in the semifinals again. So I got bronze at Brown Belt my, uh, my second year. And now, uh, hopefully this year in, in August, I'm gonna go down tighten there. Tighten her up and get uh, this. Tighten her up, fix the things that I, did, that I did wrong and hopefully come away with a Brown Belt Masters World title too. And then you're off to the black. And then, yeah, if, yeah. Uh, if my coach feels I'm ready, then yeah, hopefully I'll have my black belt by the end of this year. Awesome. Awesome, and then yeah. So like with jujitsu, now that you've uh, like, have you? What other aspects has it brought in to, like I guess, like life? Is it just into life in general? Yeah, and, like other things. They're like, hey man, like this is what I did, and this is where it's taken me. You know, obviously the world and stuff, but any other places that maybe like, oh man, like martial arts can do this as well. I I just found jujitsu is is. As much as it is a sport, it's a lifestyle. It's something that you embrace. I'll embrace for the rest of my life. I have jujitsu in my life, whether I'm in the gym or not. I'm always, it's always going to be there. And it's one of them things where once you have the confidence of learning and training and doing jujitsu, all that wanting to fight and when people give you shit and the, you know, the honking and kind of, I don't have that aggressiveness towards them. I'm like, I don't, I don't need to bother with you. I, I got yeah. better shit to do than deal with your stupid shit, right? Yeah, I don't, yeah. don't want to have that aggressive interaction with people anymore because I have the confidence that, okay, well, if you do want to bring the stupid shit my way, I've got the skills now to... Pretzel you. Uh, I can defend myself and, and subdue the situation, but the, the more I learn to fight, the less I want to do it. Yeah. Because I got, if I want to fight, I'll just go to the gym and do it. So easy. It's easy. And I got fucking... 50 guys there that want to do it too. You know what I mean? I got uh, Let's go. I got 50 guys that be like, yeah, oh, hey, fuck, pick me, pick me, right? <laughs> so it just, it really helped in, in fun and just channeling my energy and just calming me where I just, I can just live life and I, I don't give a fuck about other people anymore. Who gives a fucking what kind of bad day you're having? I don't even want to bitch at me, whatever. Yeah. Fuck a bitch. Have your shitty day. I'm going to go on with my life. Fuck off. You know what I mean? I like it. Yeah. Okay, now uh, where, so now we're brown belt, and what's your goal for the future? Like, do you want to open up your own gym, and, uh, and how are we going to get there? And how many years is it going to take? Because that's the cool thing about a podcast, now yeah. it's on video. <laughs> ideally, it. ideally, I would, I would love to open my own academy one day. How would you do it? Uh, just a matter of fucking having the drive to put the money together and just opening that school and, and going for it. Yeah, a lot of it is just having the balls to, to say, hey, I'm going to step away from this oil patch money and, and what's supported my family for 25 years 
throwing all my eggs in one basket and, and going for it. Right? That's the only way to do it. That's the only way to do yeah. it. And it's, it's a goal that I have in my head, but I, I'm trying to be more strategic about it. In my head, I've, I've never wanted to do it until I was a, a black belt. I wanted, to, I wanted to feel, if I'm going to be training people, I wanted to feel like I was le legit, oh, you know, because sure. a lot of people open schools as a blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, you know what I mean? When I first started at Gracie Baja, my instructor was a purple belt, just got his brown belt, you know, within the first year I was there, I went from purple belt to brown belt. And, you know, he was running the school and, and teaching all of us, but it was one of the things where I just was like, in my head, I was like, if I open an academy, I want it to be legit. I want it to be safe. It's, the school is run by a, a black belt. I'm a black belt and a, a legit, legitimate lineage professor. You know, I've, you know, my my lineage is now. I've got top tier Brazilians that have given my professor his black belt. He's now giving it to me. So if he's giving me my black belt, it means something. You know yeah. what I mean? He's, so in the community, when I open a school, they can say, "Yeah, this guy's legit." You know right. what I mean? I didn't always want to have that doubt in my eyes. I didn't want to be just trying to collect money from the public. You know yeah, what I yeah, mean? I didn't want to be that gym that's just trying to look to cash in just to, so I can do jiu-jitsu and get paid, right? I just, I want to give, I want to give back to jiu-jitsu as much as it gives to me. So step one, black belt. How much uh, capital would it take to rent out a space and to... It would probably, I think to get a gym... From bare bones up and running, you're probably looking at eighty to one hundred grand, probably to get it rolling. Get it rolling. Is that with enough social media or? Uh... That would be yeah. That would be finding your space, leasing your space, uh, building out your space, buying mats, uh, getting the equipment you need to run your gym, uh, bringing in supply geese, things like that. You have to buy all that stuff. Make sure when you start bringing in students. Uh, you can supply them with the geese they need, all that kind of stuff. So that's all got to be purchased ahead of time, you know. And then obviously some. Float. Then you then you need some float money to float money. as you start Supply. to bring in students because you know you're not going to get 50, 100, 150 students right off no. the bat. You're going to have five or six. So you get five or six students that are paying you 150 bucks a month. You know, that's barely going to pay your light bill. You know what I mean? Right, so yeah. you got to have some money to, to float the school till it starts to build momentum and, and you start to get students in and word of mouth and you do, you know, media and you start, you know, getting the word out there and people start coming. And as long as you put a good product out there, people will come. 100%. So, so 100 grand and then we're getting shorties, jujitsu gym. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then any other uh, goals, trips planned for this upcoming year? Are you heading... You ever gonna go visit Brazil, or are you just gonna do the tournaments in uh, Pan Ams and the Worlds? You got that plan this year? Uh, this year, I think I'm I'm looking at uh, possibly doing a tournament in July here in Las Vegas called American Nationals. Okay. And I, I basically I, I've had a pretty non-competitive year in IBJJF, and they run on a point system. So uh, the more you compete, anybody that places top three will get points. And then it, it helps with your ranking when you get to the tournaments such as Worlds, right? So right. if I can get a higher point ranking by winning a bunch of smaller tournaments, then when I go to Worlds, my ranking will be higher. It helps with your with your draw, all that kind of stuff. So I haven't I haven't been competitive at all this year at Brown Belt, uh, just due to work and life, and just I haven't been able to get away and money and things like that. Um, so I'm going to try to sneak away just so I can look at getting some. Uh, competition points and just get back on the mat and feel that that IBJF competition feeling again yeah, yeah, yeah. so when I do go to Worlds two months later You're I've kind of got that rust knocked off me right? 100% rust so, is a real thing yeah rust is a real thing sometimes you just get under the big bright lights again and have the crowds and have that feeling of being on those big competitive mats again and just kind of knock the rust off it's one of them turns where I'm, as much as I want to win if I if I lose Whatever, I'm just there to, to see what, I, what I've learned and am I ready and yeah. what i got to work on leading into the world. Yeah. Awesome. That is awesome, Shorty. Thank you for coming on to the podcast. This was great. And, yeah, now we have an evidence. Shorty's gym is going to be opening up in the next five years. Yeah, hopefully. I forget my black belt. Hopefully within five years of being a black belt, I'll hopefully have an academy. Sick. All right. Cheers, brother. Cheers, brother.